All right, good morning. Starting out with some sounds from 1925. We're going to end in 1925, and now we're starting to get music from our time period. Um, what kind of music is it? Heavy, dark, sad music? What kind of music is it? Yeah, upbeat, really light, really, really happy. These were the Roaring Twenties. We will get to the Roaring Twenties through a long course politically from the late um, 1890s. Before I get started, though, practical stuff, um, everybody online as well. The movie is due at midnight. The movie, movie, the movie analysis is due at midnight on Friday. Um, it is best, oops, let me make sure this is recording. It is best, no matter what, to turn in a paper, no matter what you got at that point. It's best to have a revised, you've done it twice, et cetera, but don't let perfect stand in the way of getting a grade for this thing. No paper, you get a zero on the assignment. Um, so turn in a paper. My, um, so with that in mind, any questions, problems, issues, anything at all, anybody's concerned about, this is gonna be your last chance to ask me in person before Friday. I can't see his hands go up online, but I don't see anything in the chat box. Everybody's feeling good about it? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay. Second is the exam is Monday. It's in class unless you cannot make it. Please let Ives and I know if you're not going to make it. We need to set up some online things to make that possible um, and to make the timing. Everybody who comes in will be taking the same exam. There'll be a kind of mix of questions on the online exam and some constraints. If you're doing it online that you're going to have to operate under. So please do let us know on that. You've all had 48 hours to look at the review sheet. Any questions about the exam? Because again, this is the last chance you're going to have to ask me in person about your first two major assignments in this week. Anything at all? Awesome. I like to think that I've given such a great roadmap. There are no questions. Um, but that's probably not the case. If you run into questions over the next couple of days, please do reach out to Ives and I. We will make every effort to answer your emails, to answer your questions, so you're prepared for the exam, et cetera. Okay. Fourth exam in the uh, fourth exam, fourth lecture in the second unit. Um, we're looking at the political questions in our second period of time. And we're mostly focusing on 1898, 1896, we'll reach back there, but really 1898 through 1929. We'll know the Republicans are dominating this era again, right? The Republicans have dominated since the Civil War. But we'll also note that the Republican Party went through some changes and then almost saw its demise at the end of this. And so this was the kind of point in time in which the party of Lincoln came crashing down um, by the end of it, but it was flourishing throughout it. Um, we begin to see in the United States an international mission emerge, and it's put through this lens of what's called the white man's burden, this, this kind of mix of a desire for markets and a desire to Christianize that we're wrapped up together. If we can create a civilization like our own, we can have people to sell our stuff to, is kind of how it worked. Um, and uh, uh, taking up of the Western Hemisphere, so the early 20th century, politically, the United States says this is our terrain, the whole Western Hemisphere, um, including the Caribbean, and also a look westward, the Pacific became our domain as well, the Atlantic was filled up. But ultimately, politically, Americans don't want to be international, so there is this culture of isolationism that's pulling America back, it's a tendency of Americans in the early 20th century, those who vote, those who have political power, to say we're better off staying out of the world's affairs. And we see this kind of um, complicating the politics as we go. Internally, and we're going to see this, it was the progressive era. It was an era of reform and an era of regulation. And all of that, we just might know, came out of the Republican Party as well and was in many ways an extension of Republican statecraft to the economic system that had blown up around them. And so in, how to think about in a nutshell, 
the first political story was about the Republican Party creating all of the all of the things necessary for an industrialized economy to take off. Railroads facilitated the far west, the minerals. The second part of this, you actually see the Republican Party trying to catch up with what it's built. It's almost like the Frankenstein monster has got a little bit out of control. And what do we do about that? And how do we deal with that? Um, so we see the emergence of laws and prohibitions and regulations and, and ways of trying to manage all of this just flower right up into World War I and then, um, and then a growing distaste for that as well because of the experiences of World War I. So we got a lot of territory to cover as usual. Let's see if I can get that to change. There we go. And here we are at the bottom of our um, fourth lecture, Unit 2, Advancing the Modern. Um, white nationalism, it is very much, I'm going to talk about a concept called whiteness. It is very much a nation that is seeing itself through the lens of whiteness and through the culture and what that meant. Um, so we're just about done with the second unit. We're going to tie up like last unit by tracing the developments on a national level. We're looking at presidential politics as a kind of marker of the national temperature and the national attitude. And we're looking at the changing face of party politics during this period. And I'll spend a little time in a couple of places thinking about the ideas that are driving those politics, some of the bigger ideas at play in political science itself. Back up really quickly. So part of what's going on in each of these political lectures is I'm organizing these politics around what political scientists have already identified in the American system, um, what they call party systems. This is the last party system we looked at. What you're looking at is a heat map of states votes. The darker the red, the more majority Republican voters in that state. The darker the blue, the more majority Democratic, right? So this was the makeup throughout that whole period, the late 19th century, right? Um, this is the creation and empowerment of the Republican party. And the heat map shows how strong party allegiance was. Republicans are really strong in the North, right? This was their industrial base. Um, very strong across the North, coast to coast, in fact, except for this little blip of populace in those Great Plains states and those silver mining states. Um, and really, except for Kentucky, maybe you could say Georgia, just not a lot of democratic strength in the South. In part, this is the aftermath of the Civil War. Right? Votes that are going Republican in the South. So it's a divided electorate so long as Blacks are allowed to vote and then it can get increasingly Democratic by the end of this. Um, we want to remember as well that it, this was dominated. This was the Republican Party period of modernization. This was the nationalization of the economy. This was the end of slavery, but the replacement of legal segregation in the South Democrats had almost nothing to do with it, except when Grover Cleveland came along twice and reformed things. So you're gonna clean up the, the, the um, payola system in Washington, um, and we've got to clean up the corruption that, that, that kind of holds our political system back. Um, and this is again, we'll just skip through this quickly, but this was the first party system. So third party system. So we move into the fourth, what do you notice different? what we're going to be looking at today. Yeah, it's a weakening of the Republican power in the North. Anything else? It's strong. The Democrats are stronger. Where? In the South. Yeah, this is the solid South. This is, this is, and this becomes a solid Democratic South um, through this whole period. And begins to propel the Democrats closer to power, starts to give them a fighting chance in this system. Um, 1896 to 1932, you can see it up there. The, the populists failed, the populist party, that, that party for the farmers and the silver miners absolutely failed to an extent it was really absorbed into the Democratic party and you see it gets Democrats get some success out west because they become a bit of a fusion party. 
um, in the face of that. And in fact, William Jennings Bryant will run four different times for president on the Democratic Party ticket. He'll lose every single time, but he'll run again and again and again, trying to make that coalition work for the Democrats. So starting in 1896, he runs those four failed campaigns. Um, we also see, because of this, like a stronger divide between the sections, particularly North and South, stronger political views, stronger um, political views in the North as well. Um, but it's still a period of Republican rule. So you can think of it as a period of Republican rule, but Republicans really having to be sensitive to Democratic wants and needs in this period. Um, Teddy Roosevelt is the first 20th century president and our first progressive president he comes out of. The Republican Party, although the Democrats will take up the Republican mantle mid um, in, in the middle of the teens. And we'll see this interesting thing happen in that Roosevelt will shift from, from making space for economic growth to going after trusts and going after monopolies and saying there's a limit on how much political power, how much economic power a single institution should have. And it's the nation state's role to set those limits. So we see laws about um, trust. We also see laws about um, work days, who can work and when. Um, and so it's really interesting. You might ask yourself, why is the party that really launched industrial capitalism and supporting classical liberalism, breaking up businesses and writing regulations in the late 20th century? It seems like an anomaly. Um, and so you want to ask yourself, did they change? Did they become a different party? Or alternatively, did the world change? And did they adjust their ideals to fit into a new world? This fourth party system, so we can see it again. So we lose power in the North, we gain power in the South. This fourth party system, um, period of regulation, period of reform. Um, and it's particularly internally and, and reform around gender and prohibition as well as businesses. Um, this is the whole period of time that we're looking at. And we can see again and again and again that except down in the house there. So just to give you a map, the top is the Senate, the middle is the president, the bottom is the house. And it tells you which party has the majority the line tells you how strong that majority is. Um, and then the color tells you which party held it. Um, and you can see it's just throughout both of these periods, it's Republican domination um, through all of it. Um, Republicans are working through a question of, you might say, as a political party, how do you launch and manage a modern economy? What's, what are the right things to do to make that happen? And then, as they find in the 20th century, what are the right ways to deal with what's happened there? And they had a 70 year period of time to ask that question. 70 years, just a whole lot of power and a whole lot of influence. When we move into um, this period, though, there's this interesting thing we noticed that despite it being the last period that the Republicans dominated, um, we actually tend to remember only two men from this era. Know who those are? Woodrow Wilson, right? They're the two progressive presidents we remember from the progressive era, although there were a number of other ones, as we'll see. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, we remember him because he launched the progressive idea. It wasn't what McKinley would have wanted. And Woodrow Wilson won because he took up the mantle of progressivism and used that for his presidency and used it to get us into World War I, but also because he was the president during World War I as well. And so a lot of the decisions that he made had significant long-term consequences. They were also the only two men in this period who had consecutive terms in the presidency. And that's partly why they stand apart as well. So Woodrow Wilson was reelected over Theodore Roosevelt. <clears throat> All right, so to get us into this political era, though, we need to rewind all the way back to the 19th century um, to begin here, to, to remember that as the United States is emerging as a significant economic power in the world in the 1870s and 1880s, it's happening because 
it has this enormous internal space that it can exploit. It's, it's, it's almost like it has this whole internal colony of mineral resources. Um, and, and the far West played a critical role in the development of the American economy. And the European powers were recognizing this by the 1880s and recognizing that their tiny little peninsula had limited resources, certainly nothing like the vast treasure trove of the American West. And they realized that they're not gonna survive this growing economy, this, this expanding economy and this competition without acquiring their own vast natural resources. Um, most historians call this period of global development a period of imperialism, um, imperialism at the, at the hands of European state actors. Generally, that's what we're talking about, Europe expressing itself. We want to and we need to distinguish this period from the earlier period of European expansion. The earlier period we could think of as a settler colonialism period, a period of time when Europeans went overseas to settle. America, the United States is the result, Australia, South Africa, places where Europeans went to make neo-Europe's or new homes. Imperialism, so the so settler colonialism is in a nutshell about Europeans claiming lands that belong to indigenous people. This is about imperialism in the 19th century is about Europeans claiming resources. They're not sending anybody to settle these places. They're sending in mining engineers. They're sending in capital. They're sending in the sort of advanced guard of natural resource mineral production. And then they're putting the people in that place to work in the spaces that they build. Um, you're sending your Navy to conquer these spaces and your industries to exploit them. You're not settling them at all. Um, and this wasn't just an abstract thing. This was an actual thing that Europeans did. Between 1884 and 1885, they partitioned Africa. They just sort of bequeathed to themselves ownership over an entire continent and said, it'll probably be a lot more peaceful if we divvy this up instead of fighting over it. Right? Um, and you can see the giant map of Africa. And this is a mapping of the results of the Berlin economy. They knew that there were regions in Africa with vast untapped mineral and organic resources. And they didn't want to fight on the continent over them. They want everybody to kind of get their share. Africa, in a way, is Europe's far west, right? They're, they're trying to get that same volume of resource exploitation. And, and so just to be a little cheeky about it, the purpose of the Berlin Conference wasn't to discuss whether African people would arrive at some diplomatic solution that was agreeable to everyone. That wasn't the question there because the lens of whiteness or white supremacy said they didn't have to act. These are uncivilized spaces. The story of the American West, probably the same story of Africa is what they told themselves. And they're doing this to avoid conflict between the nation states that are emerging, maybe emerging European powers, and to leave nothing to chance as this mass production takes off um, and a global race for mineral resources is afoot. And so Africa was partitioned like you see here. The United States didn't join this effort. The United States wasn't even invited. Um, it was, didn't even occur to anyone that this would be of interest to the United States. Um, but the United States by the 1890s does take up its own form of imperialism. So these guys are going after resources. Europeans are going after resources. By the middle of the 1890s in the United States, the idea was, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, this productive system is overproducing. We are making too much stuff. We can't buy it all. People are starting to come to us for our stuff, um, but we're too productive. And in fact, when the market crashed in 1893, economists said, this is because we're making too much stuff. 
we're overproducing. So if you're overproducing, you need more people to buy your wares. And the traditional approach to international markets for the United States was high tariffs, which meant that other countries weren't taking our goods as well. So we needed lower tariffs and we needed more customers. We need more global customers. Um, and, you know, if you looked out across the Atlantic in the late 18th, late 19th century, you saw that Europe dominated the Atlantic and it had just partitioned Africa. We're certainly not going to fight with Europe over Africa, but if you turn and look the other way, there's a vast Pacific that is hardly used. And there's this huge Caribbean of islands that Europeans try to claim on, but we're not going to let them be a part of anymore. Um, so this nearby Caribbean and this vast Pacific Ocean, and then quite suddenly at the end of the 1890s, almost without provocation, in 1898, the provocation was a U.S. Marine, a U.S. Navy boat, the USS Maine, had mysteriously exploded in Havana Harbor. Blame it on the Spanish, who were colonists in Cuba, who were colonists in Puerto Rico, who were colonists in the Philippines, who were these old colonizers still in holding on to their colonies. And um, so the United States said, you know what? We are freedom loving people. We're gonna go to war with Spain to get these people free from the colonial overlords who hold them. And the United States went to war with Spain. It was eight months. Spain was among the weakest of European powers at this point, which wasn't some major war. Um, it was a few conflicts, very quick and easy military conflicts. And all of a sudden, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Guam, the Philippines, um, where the US is claiming help uh, to help revolutionaries in each case, within eight months, Spain surrenders all of it, says we're done. Um, but the United States didn't abandon these lands. They didn't turn them back over to the revolutionaries who they said they were freeing. Instead, they absorbed them as customers and stepping stones to customers, right? So Guam and Puerto Rico, what's their status? Guam becomes what's called a US held territory. What is that? Is that the stepping stone to being a state? Well, it's been 137 years and it's still not a state. So what is it? Puerto Rico also, U.S. held territory, is that a stepping stone becoming a state? Puerto Rico is still a territory, right? It's in this, they, they both get stuck in this in-between status, but they become so, in a way, interior colonies to the United States. Hawaii will become a territory and then eventually a state. It's the only one that made it all the way through that process that was built in as early as Ohio to the United States. And the Philippines, the Philippines, the Philippines would become a colony. Ironically, right at the end of the United at the, at the 19th century, the United States changed its course internationally and said, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna keep some colonies. We're gonna keep the Philippines as a colony. We hold them as a colony until World War II. Um, the islands across the Caribbean and Hawaii, Guam, the islands across the Pacific, like this picture denotes here, were imagined as stepping stones to the largest markets, large markets in South America, and even more importantly, large markets in China, right? It had strategic importance. Um, this single drawing really gives you a sense of what the American imagination was and all its contours, actually, right? So first, these islands are stepping stones in the Pacific. But what are they doing? Well, there's this help wanted. They're actually demanded, they're being demanded this help. They perceive themselves as, in fact, look at the look on Uncle Sam's face, burdened by the work of having to bring all of these things to me. So this is this is the white man's burden, right? In, in a nutshell. Um, a lot of people, and wait, we've seen this one as well. So a lot of people in the United States objected vehemently, as you can well imagine, the United States taking a colony. Um, but the imperialists essentially argued it was an obligation. And this is the imagery and the imaginary that they used to make that argument. It was something that came with age and maturity and ability. 
that the United States had grown into this national power in the way it was imagined in 1899 was, and the world is asking us for our hand up. It's seeking our goods. Um, and I said, this was looked to a, a weird kind of lens, not just about we have this obligation to the world to provide goods, but if we're gonna get the world to buy our goods, we need to bring them up to our level. And so we also need civilized people. Civilized, I put that in quotes. These are extremely racist drawings. The first of them depicts McKinley bringing a baby savage to the river, to the river. Don't miss the gesture to baptism and Christianity, right? To wash them and prepare them for participation in civilization. And the second one shows Uncle Sam as a school teacher with an unruly group of dark skinned students in the front and an orderly group of white students sitting carefully in the back. The white man's burden, it comes with stuff and it comes with culture, right? And it comes with a hierarchy. We call it a racial hierarchy, it's clearly identified hierarchy. So let's, let's just think for a minute about the cultural ideas that were dominating these events, both for Europeans and for Americans. Um, key to understanding this, that's a book cover you see over on the right, that's Toni Morrison. She died last year, unfortunately. One of our genius, one of our literary geniuses, if you haven't read Toni Morrison, which you probably had assigned in high school some way or another, um, do read Toni Morrison. She lived, she is one of the 20th century's best writers. She, identified what she called a culture of whiteness, a culture of whiteness, okay? So it's not about, it's not about what my pinkish orange skin, it's not about what color I am at all, in fact. She said, it's this, it's, it's this larger thing we swim in that helps us shape our identity, that shapes our identity. It's the way I see myself, right? And, and it's the way some people see themselves in a way, not about the skin color, because ethnic whites um, and, and some fairly dark skinned individuals identify through the whiteness lens. Um, but whiteness requires a counterpoint. Like whiteness is not a singular identity, it's a social identity, and it requires darkness to complete the identity itself. And so this again isn't just theoretical. Toni Morrison analyzed American literature and American fiction, 19th century and 20th century, and over and over and over again, there was the trope of a main character made whole by an undeveloped black character, over and over and over and over again in literature. And for this, you can read the book in her analysis of this. She's like, it just jumps off the page. There's something in this American identity where whiteness and, and blackness are entwined in this whiteness sense. And in a sense, that identity, she says, in these fictional stories is always comparing the white person against the dark skin other in order to establish a hierarchy. And it's just a very quick category. We do this all the time. We discriminate all the time. We decide what we're gonna look at and not look at. And our values cause us to go, that's more important than this. Well, she says, Americans have done this in a fundamental way around race and whiteness and blackness in particular. Um, and she says, it's a really tricky identity because it's, it's not that when you're subject to it yourself, you're aware of it because it doesn't say to you, hey, you're making yourself superior to others. It doesn't do that at all. Um, those who see the world through whiteness actually don't think this identity has anything to do with them at all, right? The perception of those who are, who are caught in it is a perception of that other and their need for my help, their need for my guidance to redemption. And so the perception is, it's not me doing it, it's them doing it. But it's an identity, identity that projects itself out onto the world, right? But for the person who it operates within, the feeling is not, I am superior 
It's something more like, oh, that poor unfortunate person. It feels like sympathy or empathy, but it's a sympathy or empathy that entirely ignores the actual subjective existence of the dark skinned person it is being projected onto, right? Very complicated culture. And how do we know it denies the actual subjective existence of the dark skinned person it is being projected onto? How do we know this? Well, so those Filipinos we were coming to liberate and civilize said, we were supposed to be free. So they took up arms against the United States. Uh, so we can see the American response to Filipino rebels who objected to the American stains um, or who remembered our public proclamations that we weren't going to stay, that we were there to liberate them from Spain. Um, because the lens of whiteness doesn't allow you to see Filipinos as ready to take over statehood and irrational to resist the control of the United States. The idea that the islands would ever be turned over to native Filipinos wasn't even considered by the United States military. Um, and it led to this violence very quickly. And so we see these photographs and we might just remember the photographs from Wounded Knee, which is only eight, nine years earlier. Right? Dead bodies, dead dark skinned bodies that are in the way of markets and development in trenches. Dead dark skinned bodies in trenches that people have taken photographs of. Right? We have all of these photographs. And in fact, we know that some of the same soldiers who participated in Wounded Knee participated in the putting down of the Filipino rebellion as well. Whiteness as a culture accepts no objection from the subjugated of it, right? That there's a danger of violence lurking behind the feelings of generosity and the feelings of empathy. Um, so the, the uh, Spanish-American War was really this high point for McKinley himself, right? So it was, he's kind of rallied the nation we're gonna conquer this European um, giant, this, the, the first colonizer. And he was getting a lot of credit for it, but another man was kind of nipping at his heels and beginning to capture the American imagination as a result of the war. And this is Teddy Roosevelt again. Um, he's pictured here with his, this is his ragtag band of rough riders. Um, they charged, uh, I forget the name of the hill in Cuba, but they, they helped to, to drive the Spanish out of Cuba. Roosevelt had already been the mayor of New York City. He was the first police commissioner of New York City. When he was younger, he was kind of sickly and weak. And so he went out to the West and, and made himself into a man by being a cattle rancher and building himself up. Um, and he believed it was an indelible experience for his maturity. He had also already been the assistant secretary of the Navy at this point, right? So he was well ensconced in the government and he was suddenly under McKinley's tutelage, becoming a big nationalist hero, like not under his tutelage, around the side of him. And so McKinley and the Republicans were worried that he was going to run off and essentially undermine the work that McKinley had done to, you remember, get us on the gold standard, get a national economy, and aim us towards continued growth. And so their choice was to put him on the ticket. Um, I, I've said this already, this is, a, this is an effort to defang an individual for the most part. The vice presidency is the most symbolic and least powerful uh, seat anywhere in the US government. And the idea was, well, we'll use his fame to win the election, but then we'll keep him quiet, right? keep him where he needs, because he was engaged in a new set of ideas um, about how we ought to engage mass production. And you might just look at the images here as well. So this is the middle, this is the end of the 1890s, the 1900, election of 1900. Democratic presidents, when, Cleveland, when, when uh, McKinley took over, 
the, the cities are a disaster, the banks are going broke. Um, in overseas, the Spanish have people under rule. Here, American rules improved it, the banks are solid, and the cities are booming and industries are booming. Those are simple images, but that's their message. We're good for the economy, we're good for the national economy. And really, they just hope to contain the impulse um, that Roosevelt was bubbling up with, and it was relatively successful. They're losing more of the West. See, Brian's grabbed even more of the West. Silver mining states in particular, you see the same North-South divide, um, but the Republicans are still holding strong. They're winning the election handily. There's not a question about it. And the winning of McKinley in 1900 really meant the triumph of this idea, the gold standard, right? Prosperity, ongoing prosperity and national prosperity. The belief of the industrialists and the bankers were that the gold standard was the best standard, that it kept money stable and it kept, it, it prevented inflation, it prevented recession. And so this was the best way to grow forward. Um, we might look at the optics a little bit and we'll notice in a couple of units, the same optics are enlisted again in the 1980s by a campaign by the former California governor, Ronald Reagan, um, reaching out and in fact articulating, trying to recover that Republican party of the 1890s in its real heyday. Um, so McKinley means the growing industrial economy, but this um, This was in a sense, at this point in time, a solid victory about where the government was gonna go with the economy. And it was, at this point, it's gonna let it go, laissez-faire, where it needs to go. Um, but fate would have its day in this election. Um, McKinley was inaugurated in January, I believe March of 1900, and by September, he was dead. Um, he was assassinated. Um, by an Eastern European anarchist radical, by the way, who thought he was too in favor of the capitalists. Um, and Teddy Roosevelt would immediately become the president of the United States and the second president of the 20th century. And Teddy brought with him a new set of ideas about reform and regulation in, from the federal government and in the United States itself. He'd been part of, he came from an elite family, very wealthy upper New York family. Um, his cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, would be president later. As I said, early on in his life, he had been really scrawny and he went out west to make himself tough, became a cattle rancher. Um, and he was really trying to prove his manhood because he was afraid that urban living and the kind of a thief, wealthy life that he lived was going to make men soft and he needed strong men in the United States. Um, he thought that we needed imperialism. The reason he went to Cuba, the reason he supported imperialism was because he saw it as a new frontier for Americans to test their mettle on. Um, and so you can see he's kind of got the Turner thesis in his imagination about the need for the frontier. And he sees it tied up with developing masculinity and national greatness as well. And he kind of pulls it into the story. Um, you need, in a sense, and it's a very masculinist argument, that you need the challenges that something like that will face um, to bring forth your masculinity through fighting and through the fighting spirit itself. Um, and so abroad, he was very much about, and his famous language was walk lightly and carry a big stick. But what he meant was we're taking control of the Caribbean and its hours, and, and, and not only are we gonna control the trade that goes on in there? But if we find it in our interest to intervene in the politics of a nation that we don't like the direction it's going in, we have every right to intervene and nobody's gonna stop us from doing that. This is known as the Roosevelt Corollary and it asserted our dominance with the Navy, with the firepower to back it over the Caribbean and Central America in particular and increasingly into South America and it used the Navy and the Marines whenever necessary to enforce that dominance wherever it was necessary. Most important acquisition in this period was control over the Isthmus of Panama. They could build the Panama Canal 
and create a seaway from the Atlantic to the Pacific um, and save thousands of miles of shipping. In fact, they didn't actually sail all the way around South America. They were just shipping carts and whales and rail and, and, and uh, wagons and railways that carried across the isthmus. A, a, a canal would allow large ships to move through without it having to be unloaded. At home, though, he embraced what are called progressive politics, and this is the progressive era. So I want to get down a little rabbit hole here for a minute. Progressivism. There's a lot of talk about progressivism these days. Somebody's progressive this, progressive that. These days, it means you support health care and something else. But it, it was re a real set of intellectual ideas that bubbled up from kind of thinking about our conditions in the 19th century into popular culture and a set of ideas about how we ought to be carrying ourselves as moderns. And, and specifically, what is the role of the nation state in this economy that's bubbled up in our midst in, the, in, in really literally two generations? It was, in a sense, you might call it a revised understanding of modern of modernity, um, and it, it came in the wake of the economy growing and the nation state growing. Ideas about who we are and what we should be doing grew as well. Um, ideas about how the world worked and how it shouldn't work. So we could think about before we get to Lester Ward, Jane Adams. Jane Adams, in fact, was a critical progressive figure, right? Because she, in, in, in operating the Hull House, came to understand through her experience that low moral character wasn't what caused poverty, but poverty caused low moral character. And she watched children in development kind of get tested by the streets, as it were. Um, and, and so the idea that if you wanted to address vice and crime, you address poverty. You didn't put people in jail, right? That's a progressive idea, is that you can fix this by addressing the source of the problem rather than just punishing the perceived wrong. Okay, that's a very progressive idea. It builds out of this enormous work of sort of intellectual transformation that Lester Ward published in 1883. And so it's such a dense set of ideas that it takes a couple of decades for it to bubble out to popular culture, but this is the source of this ideas. And in a nutshell, he's taking on social Darwinism, as I say at the top. Does anybody know what social Darwinism? Any idea what social Darwinism is? It's a term you should know. It's related to Darwin, but it's not Darwin. It's taking the idea, a very simple idea. In fact, I bet if anybody was thinking in their head, this is the phrase they thought of survival of the fittest. That come to mind, survival of the fittest, right? So it's taking a phrase from Darwin and saying that is the operating principle in society, survival of the fittest. And so it fits nicely in a capitalist competitive environment. And, and to a certain extent, it's true. The businesses that are the most efficient, Right? The person who, who learns the most about how railroads work and can translate that to oil refineries or to steel. Right? There is something about this competitive system that emerges greatness to a certain extent. But social Darwinism said that's all natural. It's never gained. And the outcomes are always what nature would have. And so I can't recall if I've used this metaphor already in here, but you might think about that economy out there like the game of Monopoly. Who's played Monopoly? Everybody's played Monopoly. Okay. At the start of the game, everybody has an equal amount and you play until somebody's won. Imagine if every time you came back to the game, the person who won gets to keep everything that they had and you had to play from there forward. Not the same game, right? It starts to be a different kind of game. That's part of what happens in the economy as well. And that's part of what he suggests we're not noticing is that out of this insane competitiveness, we get outcomes that we don't want at all, right? Um, that the economy hasn't necessarily evenly sorted out the best people from the worst people, because in fact, there are all these various circumstances that might've led people to the point where they started. 
right? People aren't in lower positions necessarily because they're lower or they're worse. Um, but social Darwinism at this point in time and through the, all of the 19th century said to American policymakers, you don't mess with the economy. You create the space for it to grow and you let it be because it's sacred. That's a space that doesn't get touched. Um, it's, you need to let it run wild because it does its best work when it's wild. Uh, Ward said, what we don't notice again is that that's a rational structure that we're building, right? So remember the management hierarchy. You remember the management, the, the, the rational decisions to integrate and create economies of scale. There are choices built into that, Ward says, that shows humans have an ability to improve things by intervening in them. And the question is, what's our goal? If you intervene to create efficiency, humans can create efficiency. But he said, there's this greater principle that's grown up through the Western world, which is that we, pro we progress in the West by elevating the weak, right? It's a principle of Christianity itself, right? It's right there in the gospel and it's built into the DNA. And we need to bring that back into play as well. Instead of looking at the weak and the poor in our society as people who deserve to be there, because of a fair sifting process, we have to cultivate everyone. And we can cultivate everyone. And that societies can be cultivated toward improvement. That the idea that we just leave our hands off of the economy as it kind of goes crazy, he says that's the same as planting a bunch of seeds in a garden in your backyard and then walking away for the whole season and expecting something good to come out of it. Has anybody ever done that? What happens if you don't tend to them? You, you die, it'll choke out. And, and so he said, there's a lot more tending taking place in this space. Um, and we need to, in fact, attend to that. And we have a moral obligation to attend to that. The United States has already proven the ability of human beings to rationally construct their world. We can now engage our intelligence in improving it and making it better. And in fact, that was our goal. And you might think about, so he said, think about society, like the steam engine, the first steam engine, the new common engine was wasteful. It burned to way more coal than it needed to. And the mechanics were terrible. By the time you have a watt engine, you're getting 90% efficiency. And it's doing all kinds. We can do the same with society. That's our goal, right? To work, to improve the works that we've built already. And then this gentleman, you may have heard of him, not John Dewey, offered additional firepower to this set of ideas. And what he says in a nutshell, it's a little complicated, but, but knowledge is produced by doing. Knowledge doesn't happen in the abstract. It doesn't come out of, the, out of thin air, but it's produced by action and by doing things. And for him, this meant for education, you needed to be engaged in the thing you were trying to learn. But philosophically, he said, this also means that truth comes out of experience and not out of abstraction. And so what might have been a truth 30 years ago, because we've so changed the conditions we live in, truth itself has changed and we need to keep up with it. We need to confront those truths. Um, we need to pay careful attention to what experience is telling us. And if our experience tells us we need to change our mind, if our experience tells us that that policy that was good 30 years ago is doing bad things now, we need to change it. We need to reformulate our policies and we need to follow the knowledge that is being produced by the world we're living in, as opposed to hanging it on old ideas like, for example, social Darwinism, which is an archaic idea by the early 20th century. Uh, so the progressives, kind of, if you want to sum it all up, um, it's a lot of heady intellectual ideas, um, but it changed the way we thought as a nation. It changed the attitude of a nation. And it amounted to this. We, we the people in the Western world in the United States, because this was a movement of Europeans as well, are capable of understanding, of identifying and understanding flaws that emerge in the things that we built. And we are capable of fixing those flaws. 
And the thing about the progressives was they opened up the 20th century with this extremely refreshing reform movement. This is not revolutionary. They're not, they're not complaining about capitalism, right? The system doesn't need to be replaced. The system can build its own correction and it can build the wealth to make those corrections. And all we need to do is figure out how to make it more efficient and more just. And we do that by active intervention. So you see at the dawn of the 20th century, the national government in the hands of Teddy Roosevelt, and then we'll see with Woodrow Wilson, adopting a whole new belief about the reform ability of the public sector. What the federal government can actually do to kind of fix things in this enormous production machine that is going on. And so one of the ways Roosevelt did that right out of the gate was to use legislation that had been at the disposal of presidents for 15 years, um, 14 years by the time he finally used it. Um, and it was among one of the most important new activities of, of the president when he started. He brought almost 40 antitrust cases against some of the biggest monopolies in the United States. Now, Sherman had noticed in 1890 that the problem with monopoly control was it diminished market exchanges and it allowed one institution to game the system and to game the markets. And the thing about capitalism is it does best when the markets are most free, when there's a lot of decisions taking place out in the markets. And so for the Republican liberal economic economists, this, these monopolies were anti-trade, they were anti-economic anti in a sense. But, 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 but uh, uh, neither um, Grover Cleveland nor McKinley were at all interested in touching this legislation of going after these guys. Roosevelt was a different beast altogether. And he started, um, started going after them. He took, among others, Standard Oil to court, started to limit the size of economic institutions and economic influence in the economy. We're in the middle of an antitrust case right now. Do you know who's been sued for antitrust right now? One of the federal government happened just a month and a half ago. Big, big player in the account, big player in the world, in the social media world. Who's the biggest social media? Facebook? It's Facebook. Facebook has been taken which is an updated version of this antitrust, but they've been taken to court by the United States of America for monopoly behavior in this economic space. And it's gonna be really interesting to see because it's the first time this has been pressed out into virtual space. Um, but the same set of questions, they arise in the first, um, really the first five years of the 20th century. Progressivism is on us. We're gonna to start to go after the economy and right size it. And this is wildly, popular um, and Roosevelt you can see actually begins to grab those great plain states and western states as well he wins everywhere but the south right Roosevelt does tremendously well in 1904 and he continued then to grow and institutionalize the administrative capacity of the government we saw this already but this was a progressive idea even back when Gifford Pinchot was first thinking it up in 18, late 1880s this was a progressive idea that you use the state to manage your resources scientifically for the long-term health of those resources. And so Roosevelt just institutionalized all of this. And he put in the Department of Agriculture, this enormous new agency, the Forest Service, which would manage timber on public lands, the millions of acres. Remember, Roosevelt would, would put 133 million acres into the reserves. They would manage this, these forests to, to help control timber prices and to help manage the supply for the long term. Conservation in this sense is a capitalist idea. It's a market idea. And the state comes in and just makes sure nobody uses up these resources. Make sure that the trees are harvested in a sustainable way. Because if you do that, if you treat it like agriculture, you have trees forever. Everybody's got trees when they need them. And Gifford Pinchot, it becomes the head of it and his vision that started in the 1880s touring France becomes part of the federal government and part of what some of us in environmental history call the environmental management state. 
the agencies in the federal government that had to manage huge tracts of land for a service um, in, the, in the Department of Interior, the biggest one. Roosevelt was emboldened by all of this, though, and went further than just breaking up businesses. And it really, Roosevelt was willing to sign the legislation. This legislation was coming out of a ferment in the culture that's saying, you've got people in journalism who are called muckrackers, who are uncovering bad things that businesses are doing. The most famous example you might have heard of is Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. And he wrote a, a fictionalized story of these Lithuanian immigrants who worked in a meat factory. He was writing it as a political radical. And his goal for that book was to expose the working conditions that immigrants worked under with the hope that it would turn Americans to socialism. That was his, his stated goal for the book, The Jungle. He says, I aim for America's heads. I hit their stomachs because he described working conditions, food production conditions that were appalling, people's limbs going into spam, rat species, et cetera. And that public knowledge, this is remember beginning of mass culture, this public knowledge encouraged Congress to pass a whole bunch of reg regulations on the stuff we're buying and consuming, right? And so um, the, the Pure Food and Drug Act, the Meat Inspection Act, this suddenly got the federal government in the job of putting stamps on the meat that you ate so that you knew it was beef, for example. Not, you know, God forbid the dog. Um, it was a way of, and, and Roosevelt and progressives believed this, putting the state as an overseer in the economy to make sure that these enormous businesses who were doing some pretty sketchy things weren't allowed to do those sketchy things so that the American consumer could be certain about what they were buying, right? It's a way of stabilizing the market through market intervention. And Roosevelt continues to be wildly popular all the way through his second term. Everybody wanted him to run for a third term, but out of this sense of nobility, he said, no, no, I'm going to step aside. My vice president, William Howard Taft, has been just a terrific partner through all of this. And I'm gonna champion him as the next progressive president of the United States. And, and he did just that. He said, stop looking at me, I'm stepping aside. The mantle of progressivism is gonna be carried and would be, although you'll notice that the silver states and the great plains states don't all go Republican. Um, and you see as well, Williams Jennings Bryant is back in the mix again. Um, this is the last election that Bryant will run. Um, the, and, and you want to notice, and this is important because the Democrats see this, with Bryant back in, they get those Western states, right? So the Democrats are going to learn from this. Um, Taft wasn't everything that the progressives or Roosevelt wanted. He did go after trusts. In fact, he went after 70 of them. And he created the income tax as part of the Constitution. And this is marking, and the Republicans agree with this, this is marking the need to support those administrative functions that you're adding to your federal government, your Forest Service. Um, your Department of Interior, eventually your Park Service, right? These agencies of the federal government. So the tax is passed to not have to muddle with that anymore, right? And to put that in place. Um, your US anti-tax activists say this doesn't, that, that should never count, that should never have been there. Um, but Taft was much more conservative, much less willing to kind of take the bully pulpit in the way that, that uh, Roosevelt had and ultimately he and Roosevelt had a falling out. So much so that by the 1912 election, Roosevelt was saying, don't ever vote for Taft again. And he'd gone and made his own party, um, the Progressive Party. And he ran for president because he thought, what a mistake I've made handing this over to William Howard Taft. Um, and you can see what happened with that decision. So what, what Roosevelt successfully did was he split the Republican vote so badly that it was an overwhelming victory for Woodrow Wilson. Um, huge victory and a sea change 
So there's his party, past prosperity around. It's a little bit of a different message than the McKinley message. Um, and he gets some of those Northern states and California, but not even all of those. Like he's literally divided the electorate. The other part of this though, is that Woodrow Wilson had kind of forged uh, a partly progressive platform himself. Um, he called it the new freedom. Um, it changed the tariff. So you see some of these things stabilizing some of the Republican ideas, central bank, antitrust, central control of trade, and some of them reaching out to the farm loan, the Federal um, Farm Loan Act. So he's trying to split the difference and he's calling it all progressive, right? So he's, he's still in, in the American public, what they want is progressivism. What they want is engaged change. Um, early in Wilson's presidency, um, the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg took place. And we pause for a moment on this because it really did exemplify the state, not just of the Democratic Party, but the state of the United States in terms of how it thought about the Civil War at this point in time. And so we've seen, if you haven't already, Birth of a Nation, which is the Birth of a Nation, comes out two years after this. This was a huge camp out. This was an invitation to the veterans and 53,000 of them showed up to come and camp out on the Gettysburg site, shake hands across the divide, right? 9,000 Confederate soldiers showed up. And you see, these guys are getting pretty old at that point. And I just wanna read you part of what Wilson said. He said, we have found one another again as brothers, and comrades in arms, enemies no longer, generous friends rather, our battles long past, the quarrel forgotten, except that we shall not forget the splendid valor our manhood. So thousands of freed slaves fought for the Union in this war. And Woodrow Wilson said, this will be a segregated event. We will not allow black veterans. They are explicitly prohibited from joining this. And, and nobody blinked an eye. So this wasn't something where somebody said, oh, you know, well, we're gonna do this really kind of racist thing through the lens of whiteness. As you'll see, if you haven't seen it in, in Birth of a Nation, the attitude is, you know, this is a squabble between brothers and the to the problem for the black people the problem is them it's them and it's that that's the that's why they're not invited to their own civil war um, memorial um, and wilson himself was a devoted segregationist like he really embraced the the plessy v ferguson um, and he believed it through the lens that a lot of people in his position did in that day it was called scientific racism it was a belief that actually science showed us that there was a hierarchy of species. It's all bumped with bad science, but at the time it was considered to be good science. Um, so he's, he's kind of made a statement about the whiteness of this national culture. Um, he's also, we'll just remember, he starts to get hounded really early on in his term. He's going to be progressive. Neither Roosevelt nor Taft faced this, but as soon as the Democrats came in, the suffragettes went after him and they pushed him really hard and he resisted. He did not believe that women deserved the vote either and he was quite vocal about it. But the suffrage movement was on him for most of his presidency. He continued to extend and so he finally broke up Standard Oil. Roosevelt sued them, but it was, um, it was w Wilson who was ultimately successful in breaking that company apart in his suit with a new uh, antitrust law that went after them even stronger and they gave the government a lot more leverage in, uh, in breaking up these businesses. And then, and this is the hard part, identifying monopolistic behavior, what constitutes monopolistic behavior. Right early in his presidency as well, Europe went to hell. Like all of a sudden, we'll talk about the details of this in the next unit, but a set of alliances just deteriorated into what became trench warfare. And so while the US Civil War was the first industrial war of a bust, 
this is the first global industrial war ever fought. And so all of these, in, all of these um, European powers with mass production capacity started just firing at each other across this open space. And most of the space that they fought over and ended up fighting over when they were on the ground were spaces where minerals in Europe were available, the coal and the iron fields in particular. And so this was, while it was this accidental war among allies, it was ultimately about mineral resources. It's about the same questions that were asked when the Berlin Conference took place. Uh, Wilson doesn't fight. So Wilson says, we're not getting into this war because Americans didn't want to get in this war. This is, the, the, the general feeling was isolationism. And he says, I'm going to keep us out of this war, but if we can sell them stuff, we'll sell stuff. And so it's a market. He sees the war and he pitches the war initially as a market opportunity. He then creates what will be a longstanding rift in federal administrations in the West by creating the National Park Service but putting it in the Department of the Interior, which was at odds with the Department of Agriculture. And so it became this agency that controlled enormous amounts of land in the West, butting up against Forest Service land, but operated under an entirely different set of guidelines. And by the late 20th century, that starts to be a management disaster. Um, but the idea was great. And as, as, um, as one documentarian called it, it was one of America's best ideas. We set aside land, leaving them unimpaired. We let nature be in these places because they're so beautiful, that's what they deserve. Um, and Wilson, we'll see, was wildly popular. Um, he, he managed to get some headway up into the north, um, winning Ohio, you might notice, New Hampshire, and then grabbing up into the far west, Washington as well, um, one handily in 1916. Um, and he won in large part because he said, I'm going to keep us out of the war. I'm going to stop. It's not going to happen. We're going to be able to manage our engagement by sending goods in. It'll help our economy. We'll send goods, build supplies, but we won't participate itself. Now, Wilson, before becoming president, was the president of Princeton University. He's a fellow historian like myself. He was a professional historian. So not exactly the pedigree you would have expected coming into this position. And he struggled with what it was that he should do. He really wanted to be almost too intellectual. Like he didn't let the events, he thought them through when he tried to, to press them through in a sense. But the, but the moment event was that the American people were saying, we don't want to go to war. Isolationism, nobody was happy with the outcome of this war with Spain. And there literally was no interest in going and dealing with the European war. And, um, you know, Wilson has made the argument at this point, if you vote for me in 1916, I'll keep you out of the war itself. Now, we all know that by 1917, not only do we have a stalemate in Europe, but there were some telegrams that were intercepted about trying to get Mexico to attack the United States. So the Germans, in a sense, in a real sense, tried to get Mexico to attack our southern flank to get the United States weakened in the face of this and ultimately draw us into the war. And then one of our, uh, our passenger vessels was bombed out of the Lithuania, was bombed out of the, the water. Um, and there was no choice at this point. And, and so Wilson had to kind of make this shift and make this argument. And as a progressive, I just see a couple maps of the war. So this front barely moved at all over the course of the war. But Wilson had to make a case for the war. And he, he tried to be a good progressive. He said, we can en enlist our intelligence in this. And if we do it right, and we do it smart, we'll get the outcome we want. We can most definitely get the outcome we want. Um, and he said, you know, this is going to be a test of us, our modern principles. This is about our youth against Europe. He set up this whole logical argument about why, we, why the United States had a moral obligation and would create a new world order that was friendlier to us. Um, and he talked the U.S. Congress into 
moving into the war with this. And then he turned around and he set what you might call the progressive forces on the American public. It was a very famous poster. It was created by progressives early in the American entry into the war. Um, they, the idea from the progressives was you can communicate ideas really simply, a few simple words, a nice image. It's the beginning of what we come to know as advertisement and, and graphic communication. But they realize it's a very powerful tool for communicating with the masses. All of um, all of the progressives weren't thrilled with what doing uh, with what uh, Wilson had decided to do. So this is famous quote from Randolph Bourne. Um, so what Wilson said is, "The war is too strong for us to avoid. We need to get involved economically. We need to get involved with our military." And Bourne said, "Well, if it's too strong for you to prevent, how are you going to make it not change you?" as a nation, right? That the, 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 some of the progressives felt that Wilson was putting progressivism itself at risk. Um, Frederick F. Lewis Allen at Newell said, if we go marching in to fight the Prussians, the authoritarians, we will become like them in a sense. He said, we really need to look out for this. Wilson said, no, that's not going to happen. We're going to move forward with this. Um, and he really didn't listen to the other progressives as he went into the war um, and really pitched this idea. So this is his secretary of agriculture. We can look forward confidently to a post-war period where Europe's going to need all of our goods. So this is a good thing for us to come into so we can bring it to an end and start selling things. In order to get the kind of run of the mill American behind the war, they started sending out educational packages to public schools which were designed to teach school children to fear the Germans and be more patriotic. They started going, well, we need to generate the cultural support for the war as well. And in fact, put together a committee, George Creel put this together, called the Committee on Public Information, which was entirely targeted at getting support for the war itself. Um, and it starts out relatively innocuous, right? These large posters, here's some things we need. We need to knit some socks. Maybe we should plant the victory garden. Um, it, it moves towards a little bit more of a kind of militaristic, work, although playfully so, but you're needed, your service is needed. But very quickly within the year, it begins to descend into some much more darker images as well. Um, and, and suggests Germans are animals. The Germans aren't even, they're, they're not even civilized. They're not capable of, this um, and this message really started to become the message because it was one that worked the best. They're like, these are dangerous, dangerous people. Um, and they had a campaign, in fact, that was all over the United States. These four minute men who would stand on a corner, it's like you know, going on to social media today, would for four minutes give you a report on the atrocities that the Huns had taken um, in, in that time, that week in the war. So, this darkening kind of angry growing intolerance of Germans to such a degree that we actually see German Americans assaulted in public here in Ohio and around the upper Midwest. Someone speaks with a German accent, Americans start going, that's the enemy. Some, one guy, for example, was stripped naked and hung from an American flagpole um, and told to recite the constitution, et cetera. These kinds of mob actions started appearing all over the United States as a result of this kind of growing idea that the Kaiser was evil and the Germans were evil and it was good versus evil in this campaign. Um, and we see this intolerance emerge. We saw that first immigration act, we're gonna ban everyone. Like there's all of the sudden progressivism starts to get kind of dark and ugly and fearful and, and authoritarian um, in some really unexpected ways. Um, and in fact, we see these two men committing violations of the Constitution. They start, they start reading press. They start banning newspapers. They start acting the state itself like authoritarians. And so by the end of the war, this idea that progressivism could somehow logically bring us through this thing is out the window. Like we've become the beast we didn't want to be. Uh, meanwhile, the culmination of the suffragettes are putting this pressure on, um, and I told you about this last time, on Wilson. And it really is this cauldron of the war making American culture go sour 
and this last minute push by Alice Paul to humiliate Wilson that forced him to change his mind about whether or not he'd support the vote. And this was a last ditch effort on his part to preserve himself. He was willing to support it because one of the things the suffragettes did was they linked their vote to a ban on alcohol. And so the women's vote and prohibition are a one-two punch of the same movement and the same effort to extend rights and to stop alcoholism was considered something that men did to women. And so it was part of the same feminism when it came up. And, and as I said, Alice Paul picketed Woodrow Wilson and eventually got this passed. But by the end of the war, Americans were tired. They were tired. Um, and I'm gonna quickly just race us through the 20s because we're gonna get back to them again. Warren Harding, second most boring president ever, but the Republicans come back. So one, what, what, what Wilson did was he grabbed the progressive ideal over to the progressive, over to the Democratic Party, and then he soiled it for the war. Nobody wanted progressivism anymore. Nobody wanted what people wanted by the 1920s, what they called the return to normalcy. What did they mean by normalcy? They meant the heady days of the 1890s, the early McKinley administrations, when factories were booming and things were growing and life was good. There was a new sense of isolation. We don't want to go to war. We don't want anything to do with this. And you might recall Woodrow Wilson tried to create an international body called the League of Nations to prevent these wars from going forward. American Congress said, we don't want anything to do with that. We're going to turn inward during the 1920s, inward and southward, a lot of activity in Central America and the Caribbean and the maintenance of our, our sort of small territorial empire in that region. And then you can see the Democrats even better in 19, I mean, Republicans even better in 1924, the Republican Party's back, but they're back as a hands-off laissez-faire party. Okay, we're not gonna regulate things. We're not gonna interfere in businesses. We're not gonna break up, break up trust. We're gonna go back to the heady days of the 1890s and the early McKinley administration. And the most boring president ever, Calvin Coolidge, he embraces mass culture. Um, and so he's at the, the World Series games and we're just, America's doing great. Oh, we need to shut down our borders completely by the by. Um, and so the, probably the, the most serious piece of legislation in this arena, in this period of time. But you heard the music at the beginning, right? That was music from 1925. Henry Ford was producing and selling 2 million automobiles a year. And there were four other auto companies RCA was making radios by the millions. The roaring 20s, like it, 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 we were back. We were back. And that was the sense of the nation, this exuberant. And important fact, as of 1920, half the population lived in cities and it grew from there. So we became an urban nation demographically in these years as well. And then in 1928, it was like the Democrats were going on decimated. We don't see a Republican victory like this until Ronald Reagan. Oh, yeah, Hoover. Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover, um, really the pinnacle of this second industrial revolution. He himself was a mining engineer. Um, he had been the assistant secretary of commerce. He understood business. He also understood the responsibility of government. He led uh, a task force to end famine in Belgium at the end of World War I, successfully ending it there. But he was part of that Republican idea of the 1920s, hands off, like it'll fix itself. Things will be fine. Well, things were fine. In fact, when he got elected, there was no sign of any problem. But we remember this is an economy that's ballooned on consumer credit. It's depending on next year's paycheck. It's depending on everybody having faith in next year's paycheck. And literally within months of Hoover taking office, the Dow Jones crashes, that bubble bursts. And Herbert Hoover says, it'll work itself out. Like he does a little bit, he doesn't do nothing, but it'll work itself out. Just, just hang in there. And it kept falling every year of his presidency. So he does a little bit more, but like it'll work itself out. And people are showing up in Hoovervilles in these encampments of homeless people around cities. And he's like, it'll work itself out. It works itself out. 
works itself out. And we see by 1932, the most radical change of fortune in the United States since the Republican Party came into power. So that's our 28 election. That's our 32 election. And so at the end of four years of, of, of really what was at that point the greatest Republican leader in the history of the party, his name would be Mudd. The Republican Party would be crushed. They didn't respond. Americans, while they weren't progressive, they didn't want 25% of unemployment and nobody doing nothing. And we'll see in the next unit, in the 1932 election, this gentleman, the cousin of Teddy Roosevelt, offered a whole new vision for America, right? And a whole new vision for the future. And at that point in time, except for Upper New England, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, everybody wanted some of that. Um, huge sea change. And this marks the emergence of the modern Democratic Party. Okay, this is where we'll end here. Um, I will see you all in class on Monday for the exam. Please let me know if you have any questions as you're trying to get ready for it. Please take it seriously. Thank you.